system. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to offer a, a brief contribution on these bills and on the topic of private health more generally. Uh, as Senator Scar has pointed out, we do have a health system that is a mix of public and private health care. And our tax system actively incentivizes many Australians to hold private health insurance. In fact, uh, from the most recent statistics that I can see, well over half of us now have pro private health insurance. And that number has been growing since the, the pandemic. People uh, obviously value their health and, and they are taking up private health insurance. Given these incentives and potential extra tax for not, not having private health insurance, I feel that we as a parliament have a duty to ensure that the system is working efficiently and is delivering the care that Australians need. And the system clearly has its challenges. Uh, we have a range of commentators who, who all have you know, various views, but it's really important that we remember that this is affecting Australians' lives. People are feeling the effects of this when the system, whether it's private or public, doesn't work for them. And this is something that I hear about a lot from uh, my community here in, here in the ACT. Uh, people frustrated uh, with what they see as, at times, a lack of value. Uh, to give you one, one example, I recently heard from a gentleman living uh, here in the, in the south of Canberra. He had been uh, to have a treatment at a uh, prosthodontist which cost him 1500 bucks. Uh, he was reimbursed just $57 by his fund. Uh, despite estimating that he's paid around $47,000 in premiums over the last 15 years. Uh, you know, I, I don't claim to know the specifics of this case and, and the level of, level of coverage he had, but it's hard to see that this gentleman received value for his investment uh, in this specific interaction. He's been paying over $3,000 for the last 15 years and is out of pocket $1,400 for a procedure. Each year, the ACCC delivers a report to the Senate highlighting some of the key trends in private health insurance. Uh, I thought I would highlight some of the figures that stood out to me in, in their 2020-2021 report. Uh, the average gap expense for hospital treatment increased by 9.5% on the previous year. It has increased by 23% over the last five years. Private health insurance management costs have increased by 8%, or about $200 million. That's an extra $200 million in salaries, management costs and bonuses. And at the same time, the number of exclusionary policies grew by 150,000 policies, or by around 4.6%. According to the ACCC, this is part of a long-term trend which has seen the number of policies with exclusions grow from 28.7% in 2012 to 61.3% today, which is likely a function of people cancelling top cover and opting for low-cost basic policies to avoid the, the added tax expenses. I've written some good news. Uh, the industry appears to be making good on their promise not to profit from the pandemic, and has reported returning a total of $2.1 billion to consumers up to the 30th of June last year. It's also worth noting that premium increases have generally been lower over the past couple of years, certainly lower than inflation. However, the cost of living is really hurting Australians at the moment, and every percentage point matters. Uh, from the insights delivered by the ACCC, it's clear that the system is just not working as hard as it can for patients. It can, it can work harder. And that brings me to these prostheses benefits, uh, the topic of the bills in front of us today. Uh, I've spent a number of weeks uh, delving into uh, 
this legislation and some of the complexities, and uh, I can report that it is indeed a complex area of policy. Uh, it's a system that seems quite precariously balanced between a number of interests. Uh, last year, the government entered into a four-year agreement with the medical technology industry to drive savings on prostheses benefits. Prostheses benefits will now reduce over the next four years and will be aligned with public sector prices. However, the prices won't be able to fall below a 7% floor. They will have to be 7% higher than in the public system. And it should be noted that the ACCC has raised some concerns with these arrangements. Uh, to quote from their report, while the ACCC welcomes efforts to reduce the underlying cost of prostheses, the ACCC notes that the MOU's flaw on prostheses benefit reductions is likely to have some distortionary impacts on prices for medical devices in private healthcare. I understand this is a, this is a complex uh, system and there are, there are many different factors to take uh, into account. In some instances, it's very hard to compare uh, what's happening in, in, the, in the public system with, with the private system. But that aside, these savings that have been committed to, you know, around $900 million, almost a billion dollars of savings on the table over the next four years from the medical technology industry, these should be delivered to consumers. And I have, I have drafted a, an amendment that would uh, mean that there is an update to the sort of long-standing OPD where the ACCC reports um, into uh, private health. And it would simply look at how much of these savings are being realised from this agreement and how much of them are being passed on to consumers. Something that I think this uh, parliament has a, a duty to do. When, when these sorts of savings are put on the table for consumers, we can put processes in place that actually just check on them and make sure that they are, they are flowing. Um, we can't have a system where large deals are agreed to by government and then have no scrutiny. And there, there really is no, no point in having this generous offer of almost a, a billion dollars over four years uh, and that not flow on to consumers, people who are paying their premiums every month for themselves, uh, for them and their partner or, or for their whole family, deserve to see a share of that almost a billion dollars in savings. So I have, I have circulated an amendment, I believe it is a very minor one, it's simply adding uh, a little bit more scrutiny uh, and I, I would hope that the Senate will, will support it. I do not see a good reason not to support transparency measures given this, this generous uh, deal that we've seen that is going to deliver these, uh, these savings. I'd also like to just finally raise some concerns around the lack of visibility of the delegated legislation. Uh, Senator Scar has also raised this. As a new parliamentarian, I've been pretty shocked, frankly, how much is done uh, by delegated legislation from ministers. Uh, yeah, I understand that's how it's done, but there should be scrutiny of that. If, if we don't have... Uh, Ideally, you have the ability to debate it here, potentially amend it in the, in the Senate. But if there are bills that simply allow delegated legislation, I really believe that there should be visibility over that, that delegated ledge so we can have a look, about it, ha look at it, have, have the debate in this, in this context, rather than having to try and use what is a very blunt instrument uh, of disallowance. Uh, for me, the first is, is certainly preferable and being on the uh, scrutiny of delegated leg uh, legislation committee, I really would echo Senator Scar's concerns around non-disallowable instruments. Parliamentarians are elected 
by their electorate or by their state or territory to scrutinise legislation and to have a system where there's a whole range of things that are non-disallowable doesn't make sense to me. It, 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 to me, it doesn't pass uh, the pub test when it comes to politicians being elected to be there to represent the people um, that vote for them. So I, I support this bill. I really would uh, 